time being uh, documented. All right, that's a list of this, but don't worry, I mean, Alata Ale is watching all of us, so we can't escape in that sense. So um, one of the things that, that we're going to do today, and unfortunately, there's going to be some humongous time skips, which I do, um, you know, do apologize for. We, we, we don't have any fillers today, but we do have some time skips. And this is naturally going to happen because it's 600 years of history, right? And 600 years of history is exceptionally difficult to cover. What we were trying to do is trying to, uh, as you guys know, is trying to introduce you to Ottoman studies, but at the same time, um, trying to encourage you to want to learn and study it beyond these, these classes. Now, I'm always available for you, so that's not a problem. Whenever you have a question, or whenever there's something you want to ask, or there want something you want to know, I'm not a human encyclopedia. I'm going to tell you that now. I don't know everything, but more or less, because I teach this on a day to day, I, I have a a general grounding of what's going on in that sense. So always feel free to contact me whenever you feel it's necessary. And once again, if I ever come down to High Wycombe, please come over, pop over and say hello. And um, um, we won't talk about Liverpool too much, but um, if you want, we can do that as well. All right, so this will be the last week in Shola. So let's let's get ready to roll. The end. Oh, wow. So um, this is an upgrade on the one that I have. Okay, so let's look at this. So the 17th century, one of the interesting things we spoke about, we, we began with the the, um, the killing of Genj Osman last week, which was the beginning of the 17th century. And one of the interesting things about the 17th century is we are starting to see a sort of a shift in, um, in the political structure, right? So before, when we talked about the political structure, it was the survival of the fittest, right? The strongest prince who could make it to Istanbul would be the one who'd be chosen to be the leader of the state. And unfortunately, the other prince would be marginalized in some shape or form. And on many occasions, they would be killed or assassinated. The reason for that was to make sure that they didn't start a rebellion against the Sultan in, in the center. Now, it's true, and a lot of us believe this and are aware of this, that in Islam, family ties are strong and families should stick together and support one another. But in reality, that's not always the case. And as I mentioned to you before, that families were feud over all sorts of things, from property to, to money and so forth. And in this case, the stakes were very high. The contestation was not over family or land or property, but was on the future of the state and the future of Islam. And as a result of that, when the stakes get higher, um, you know, then it's going to get kind of messy and dangerous. But after the the, um, the killing of Genj Osman at the hands of the Janissaries, what happens is we have a change in the political structure of the Ottoman state. So it goes from a, a Ottoman state in which the Sultan, uh, the Sheikh Sadis are, are, are trying to make their way to Istanbul to the point that now the Janissaries, along with the ulama in Istanbul, have a stronger say in who should be the Sultan, who should be the next Sultan, right? And so Istanbul became a, a space of factions where particular factions would line up to try to make sure that their chosen, the person who represents their interest is the one who should be in power. Okay, and this is continuously happening in the 19th century. I mean, in the 17th century, uh, this is uh, so. Uh, Baki Tezjan, we mentioned this last week, it's a famous academic. He called this the second empire, meaning that the first empire was um, what you would call, and he used the em word empire loosely. So, it was from Fatih's period, you would say, or maybe no, after the interregnum up until you would we would say, uh, Genj Osman. This is a particular empire which has a particular set of rules and laws. And then the second empire in the 17th century means that there's new traditions, new ways of doing politics. The, the, one of the um, advantages of the Ottomans and the Ottoman state in particular was its ability to reinvent itself. A bit like new labor in, in, in England, the ability to reinvent itself. And one of the interesting things or the important things to remember is that longevity of anything whether it's an idea, a group of people, a party, or a state, is dependent on its ability to transform over time. Okay, nothing remains static or the same forever. Everything evolves and moves over time. So I give an example, just so that you guys, on a very basic level. So for example, I'm a Hanafi, right? But I'm not practicing the Hanafism per se of Abu Hanifa. 
there's been a transformation, even though the tradition has remained within the framework of tradition, but tradition has the ability to transform gradually as well, to be applicable to the times and needs of the time, right? And that's the same thing with the politics, that adjustments take place, and so Barclay says Jan called this a second empire. So, um, we start to see, um, a, a, this is now a, a period of consolidation, uh, the rapid expansion, or like how Man City went from League One relegation to the Premier League champions. Yes, we can give you that. All right. Um, so what what we see and um, is um, a rapid expansion, right? And I give an example of 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 what happens when you rapidly expand. Let's look at Leicester City. So you know um, when you rapidly ex expand, one of the things that happens is if you don't then consolidate your authority. Um, you're going to find it very difficult to take care of everyone. And I'll give you an example. Let's just say, um, um, if you um, have, I can't think of a, a good example for you, but okay, let's just say um, um, your family and you have one child and you have one child every two years. And then over this period of eight years, you have four children. That's far more manageable for a family than to imagine having four kids on, on, on the same time. All of a sudden, that, that, that those numbers of people that, that you have to take care of, it becomes a lot harder. And so one of the interesting things about the early Ottomans is while they had expanded their domains rapidly and successfully, and this had something to, to do with their strength, their willingness to expand, and the, their tactical guile, and the weakness of the opposition, at the same time, there is a cost to that rapid expansion. And uh, the cost is, how do you think people learn Islam? They don't learn Islam just by expanding, expanding, expanding. There has to come a point where you have to remain stationary. You have to bring people into those domains. People have to teach Islam. Islam has to be lived. It has to be an experience. And it has to go from generation to generation. And so this is what we call consolidation, okay? In that sense that you have to consolidate your authority. And we see this with people who convert to Islam. Okay, in that sense, like um, they, they, they need time to, to live with Muslims, interact with Muslims, to understand Islam and so forth. So this is, is necessary. So this is happening, imagine on a scale, uh, on an empire wide, if we're going to use that word loosely in that sense. So the 17th century becomes that. Um, now, one of the things that happens then is that the Ottomans allow local leaders um, to take care of their own affairs. And once again, if we're going to... Um, uh, look at a, a particular structure, it's like having a business with many departments and basically allowing every manager to deal with their own de department and you trust them, right? Because you don't have the resources to check everybody and also people don't like being micromanaged. If the manager is ma the main boss is checking every single person, it creates a sense of suffocation. So in this period, what we have, we, we have a period in which local leaders now are taking care of their own affairs, right? And what we see then is because it's a period of consolidation, we start to see the development of intellectual ideas and cultural studies. And culture and ideas um, and arts and architecture and, and these sort of things, um, they develop in moments of peace, not in moments of tension, stress and war, right? So for moments of peace, you need um, what you would say, moments of consolidation. It's one of the arguments people put for Muslims in, in the West, that we're always being agitated to the point that we're never allowed to have moments of peace where we can actually flourish as people within this, the countries we live in. And as a result of that, that's one of the, the tensions we have. But when we are given moments of peace, and moments of time and tranquility, we can then develop our own thoughts and ideas, right? In that sense. So um, you see this, and so um, you start to see initially a, a sort of like shifting of different sultans um, because now the, the system is based on choosing a sultan rather than survival of the fit, fittest, there is almost an internal contestation of which sultan should be in power and so forth. And you start to see a lot of like, um, you know, changing of the guard quickly in that sense. Um, we can go to the next uh, slide, um, Asim, if you want. I, I was just wondering about the one of the things that you see in this period is the cage system mm. in that 
the sultan is no longer governing a territory yeah. all the all he he takes power and all his brothers are just expected to live under house arrest yeah. and if he so dies they might bring them out so they don't have this training on the ground yeah. they have no idea how to govern a lot yeah. of them have mental problems yeah. this is something we're starting to see in this period as well right they're not leading armies okay so one of the interesting things is is before do you remember we, we i don't know if we spoke about this but the idea of fratricide right Right. which was the fear of a possibility of a brother um, coming to Istanbul and raising an army and, and contesting the Sultan. So as a result of that, um, the fratricide became very problematic. And so as an alternative to the fratricide, because initially what would happen, so remember we spoke about Yavu Sultan Salim, and he was living in Trabzon, right? And uh, Fatih was in uh, Amasya and, uh, and so forth. So what happens is they were outside, they were... Um, uh, working as governors, learning the trade, as you said, learning how to lead people. Um, they were also going on expeditions of war, and so they were learning politics and war and so forth. But because of the fratricide that, that nearly um, created a huge internal trauma, and as you know, many of the ulama complained about the fratricide being unacceptable, an alternative to that was then, was to, make, was to say, all right, rather than sending all these kids uh, everywhere and then there's going to be a contestation for power. Why don't we just keep them all in one place where we can take care of them, we can regulate them, we can keep an eye on them, and then we can choose one from amongst them. But then there's, as you as you rightly mentioned, uh, Asim, there's, a, there's an adverse effect to that, which was many people stuck in one place, almost caged and imprisoned in, disconnected from the mass, disconnected from the nature of what it meant to live in a domain so large, right? Because you don't even know what it looks like anymore because you're not moving around in it. The earlier sultans were traveling sultans, they were moving sultans. So they got to, to get a grasp of speaking to people, seeing what's happening on the ground, seeing the different types of people, the different ethnicities and terrains, whereas now you're in, in, in the center. In that sense, it's in this period that Istanbul becomes an uber center for the Ottoman Caliphate in many ways. But then, as you rightly said, it makes different complexities where imagine the, the palace is just a glamorized prison in many ways. If you went outside, you probably get killed or assassinated. So you don't do that. You just stay indoors. Now imagine being stuck indoors. Um, well, we are. We're living it right now. Exactly. In the right. Exactly. That, and that's a really good point. But not all of them are crazy. But sometimes what happens is for an alien to pass a fatwa over, um, they would make the suggestion that he was crazy. Now, I, I, we weren't there at the time to really judge to what degree or to what level that they were actually um, insane in their mind. Um, all of those best but but the point i'm making is they may have been crazy or it may have been used as an easy way of diagnosing or for them maybe a more humane way of removing somebody from power because you needed a a, a proper shadi reason to remove someone from power and imagine um the inability to find a, a decent shadi reason to remove someone from power but you know the person's incompetent then you would just make the case of insanity i guess uh, so that was yeah. one of the reasons no, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so now we come to Mehmed the fourth, I think it is. Oh no, sorry, wait. These. The Kopral, yeah. So the Fuad Kopral is is interesting. So uh, you know, it's interesting. It's Fuad Kopral. No, sorry, not Fuad Kopral. Fuad Kopral is Fazir. a historian. Sorry, Fuad Kopral is a famous Ottoman historian. The Kopral era is is the period when the the grand the office of the Grand Vizierite became strong again. The Kopral family in particular, um, were Albanians, but they're from a place in Anatolia called Kopru. So it's intriguing, you, you see how this operates. And what happens in this period with the constant um, weak, the constant transitions of sultans meant that the House of Osman as an institution was pretty fragile. And so then authority needed, there needed to be some level of stability somewhere else. And so, as I mentioned to you before, the Grand Vizier was often a delegated space for where somebody would, like, a, imagine like a so clock is the manager, and then Jordan Henson, I know I use Liverpool, but Jordan Henson is the man, is the, the captain on the, on the pitch, right? So he basically, when the manager is, let's just say, sick or red carded, and he has to go to the stands, the captain is, is, is the delegated person to make all those decisions in that sense. And we have something similar in the United Kingdom, but a little bit different in terms of the monarchy and the prime minister, although the prime minister is more powerful. And in this period, you see that the, the Grand Vizier's office became far more significant in the decision-making process than the Sultan himself. 
And what's interesting here is then you see the, the ulama, the janissaries, the office of the grand vizier, and the sultan. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe works better. The cricket is the example is a, a, a lot better, yeah. Um, and um, they became competing institutions for power because different institutions um, had different interests in the heart. Um, the interest, although they all had an interest in Islam, which is fine, everyone does have an interest in Islam, but the Janissary also had an interest of self-preservation, right? The ulama had an interest in ulum al din and ilm and their institutions. The Grand Vizier had an interest in the concern they had with the weakness of the House of Osman, and the Sultan had an interest of the survival of the Sultanate. So when you have these sort of things, you, you naturally have contestation in any field, in any walk of life. That's, you know, irrespective of if they're Muslim or not, this is something that's... And this was the period of the strength of the Koplulu era, era, in which the Koplulus had found a way of consolidating a particular form of authority, but also efficient, efficiently running the, the Ottoman devlet. But what's interesting in this period is the Kadazadilis. We didn't mention this, but... Um, I want to mention the Qadr Zadil list to you. Let me see if I can write it here like this. The Qadr Zadil. Okay, the Qadr Zadil. And the Qadr, uh, my, my, um, I don't have a Turkish keyboard, so I have to, I've written, in, written it in a way that you can read it. The Qadr Zadil is well, a conservative um, Muslim uh, group of people now i think it's a little unfair that people have tried to um as a way of people understanding them they have sort of like um suggested that they were like the salafis of today which is a little unfair because the katazadilis i mean i think it's unfair because i don't like using like um you know like these sort of like um words to tarnish uh, anyone in the present or in the past in any shape or form i don't think these sort of comparisons should be made but you will see that a lot in the literature amongst Muslims, and this is why I'm mentioning it to you. But what the Qadazadilis were, I mean, some people would relate them to, um, you know, uh, people who are more like uh, um, hadith-driven, and, and this is why they, 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 they've been uh, faced in this way. Um, but the Qadazadilis were a conservative core of, of a Muslim movement in particular, who were critical of the ulama, and in particular critical of, of dervishes, and certain practices of the Sufi tariqats. And so there was an emergence of this in Istanbul and in the Balkans, which was interesting because what happened is that they operated almost as a, um, as a powerful intellectual and cultural police force. They were basically policing Islam in Istanbul. And even if they were not powerful or strong, one of the interesting things that they had the capacity of was to always set an agenda. Right. And for those of you who will go to university or so forth, one of the things you'll realize is we have ISOCs in the university. And even though the ISOCs are quite, um, uh, um, you know, um, people of different ideas and different backgrounds, but there is a conservative core which somehow can maintains um, its ability to regulate everybody. It just does it, even if they are minority, even if it's one person. There's something in the, the, the framework of conservatism which does that, right? Which has the ability to at least um, become a position which people judge each other by. And so this is what happened with the Qadazadilis. And so the rise of the Qadazadilis happens in this period. And this is a very interesting period in that sense. So on the one hand, we're seeing the rise of culture and intellectualism. And on the other hand, we're seeing what you see the emergence of a particular form of uh, a particular form of conservatism in Istanbul, which had never been seen before in this shape or form. Um, which is unique. And then what you, you realize then in Islamic history is that there are always going to be factions, peoples and movements who are going to um, represent a particular form of, um, I wouldn't say Islamic conservatism because I think that's unfair, but a particular form of, 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 of a tradition which has um, uh, far more limits in some ways. And that's always going to be here till the end of time. Okay? By, by conservatism, you sort of mean that they had an idea that Islam was being distorted and yeah, that's right. yeah. preserved in its yeah, original yeah, form. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a better way of explaining it. Yeah. And for the record, they were Hanafi, Maturidis, and they that's were Sufis right. themselves. So they weren't Salafis, yeah. but they were, and they were followers of a great Imam called Imam Birgawi. Yeah. And, and this um, is why I don't like using that term because 
Um, what, what people do is, is because they want to find something relatable to today, they use these, these simplistic ways of, of, of um, comparing things in, in history and so forth, which is a little unfair. Um, everyone is, has their own unique space and moment in a particular given time in history in that sense. Um, so, yeah, so this is basically what happens. And um, it's a moment where the Ottomans are, are looking for consolidation, but it's also a moment where the Ottomans now are struggling in regards to, um, uh, you know, warfare. Um, that we start to see particular challenges. We start to see the emergence of Russia as a power. We start to see many areas within the Balkans, um, uh, we, in, in the Balkans between um, people wanting certain levels of autonomy. We see in the Balkans, the Balkans becomes a, a playing field where the Austrians, the Russians, and the um, and the um, and the Ottomans are now competing with each other. Okay, yeah, I mean, okay, the difference between Hanafism and Maturidism is that Hanafism is the matab you practice in the way that you you you, you practice probably what you say um, everyday rituals. And Maturidism is the the I is the way that you understand so, I don't know, maybe exactly the ideals and so forth. But they're interlinked in many ways. Um, it's just um, that one is more to do with jurisprudence, I'll say actions, and the other is to do with your philosophy about life, if that's the easiest way to explain it to you. Um, okay, we can go on to the next slide. Um, after this one as well? Or? Yeah, yeah, we can, because we're, 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 time is just going to kill us today. Hmm. I just just the idea though that that there's still a, an expansion taking place, and now there's yeah. an I, idea of overextension. Maybe that's you, you know what the interesting thing about expansion is is that it, we seem to assume that expansion is like, I don't know if you can see me it's like like that, like the big you know like how the West took with a big bang, but actually Ottoman expansion is like that, like that, like that, like that, like that, like that. So it's it, you know it's in in it, it's growing and then retreating and then growing and then retreating and then growing in another place and it's constant moving of pieces. Um, but you're right, it, it's not static. In that sense, this is why um, some historians, including myself, prefer to, to call it the Ottoman domains, because the frontiers are always moving. They're never remaining static. And that's because, you know, there might be an expansion in a particular area, then a retreat from a particular area, then an expansion. And as I mentioned to you last week, that the Ottomans were not a colonial power. The way that the Ottomans worked was in a client-based system, right? That they were going to a place, um, defeat them, and then they were going to negotiation with those people about uh, maintaining a particular relationship. And at times, people, including Muslims, so when you see, like for example, Yemen, Yemen was a known place regarding Ottoman history, where it constantly went in and out, in and out regarding his allegiance to the Ottomans. Yeah, so even Muslims would do this, and so this is why you see this is a, a known period um, where this is still happening in that sense. Yeah. And the final thing about 1683, I think, is just the idea that this was the the the, the peak expansion. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 And and then after that, um, it, it it becomes very difficult. It becomes untenable. In, and in the, and the siege of Vienna. I mean, we, okay, we we will just gloss over that. But there's an idea that some people see this as the, you know, the last attempt, the last hurrah, and then. So, the so Vienna Vienna is seen as as important on two occasions because it's the second siege of Vienna. So there was a first siege of Vienna that happened during the time of Suleiman, and the failure that happens in Suleiman's period, and an assumption that we would come back again, in that sense. The Ottomans, I'm using the word we, represented the Ottomans that they would go back. And, and, and go after Vienna, and Vienna was perceived as a particular golden apple that they were after. Um, and they attempted it again, and, and they, they failed again uh, in, in, from their perspective. And once that failure had occurred, it was perceived that um, this was a turning point, that um, you know, um, the inability to, to ram home a particular uh, um, sort of form of victory. And this in some ways was a turning point in many ways because even Europe was changing now and the European powers also um, got their act together for various reasons. I said to you before, the European identity is based on two things. It's, the, it's based on the internal contestations that happened amongst themselves which facilitated the idea of the separation of church and state. That's one. And the second thing is the fear of the Ottoman. Okay, the fear of the Ottoman in that sense. It, it, it does it is part of the narrative. It's important to understand that, that why in Europe do they still have a fear of Muslims to some degree in their various shapes of form? Because the memory of the Ottoman is still very fresh, even mm -hmm. though so many years have passed.
because they, their states were built on that. Their states were built on the separation of church and state, uh, which was which came about from the internal contestations they were having amongst themselves and the fear of the Ottomans. Uh, and, and that's something that remained in their memory. So the, for the Europeans, the, 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 the failure of Vienna was huge. They, they, in European literature, less so in Ottoman literature, but more so in European literature, they have placed this as a really important event because for them, they perceived it as a great victory for the, Euro for the Europeans, as well, in the sense that that was the moment where Ottoman expansionism stopped. You don't see that narrative as strong in the Ottoman perspective, um, but you do see it from the, the European perspective, in terms of this Eurocentric perspective, in this way. Um, it, it's a turning point for them. Okay. We're ready. The tulip, or do you want to go past that as well? So I can't see the slides. That's why maybe I'm going to be crazy. Um, oh, can you not see them at all? No, I can't see them at all. This is why. Oh, um, so sorry. I'm. I'm. <laughs> no wonder. Where... No, I'm okay. like, this is, sorry, man. I'm like confused. I'm like, what's going on? And is there a reason for that, or? Um, have you shared it with me, or is it like? It's on the. Um, I'm, I'm presenting. Everybody can see it. You can't see it. Oh, I can see it now. Okay. 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 Sorry. Sorry. That's my fault. I. I so I'm that's using, why this I'm is using the my iPad. So sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the map, and that's why I was. Yeah, and that's. Yeah. That. This is. Yeah. Okay. So can we go back to this? Is a great map, you know, in the way that we see, like, I, because I we've showed you maps for the last two weeks, and but one of the important things what you see about maps is you know how difficult it is to have soldiers in all of these areas um, protecting the border fronts it's really hard so what you need is you need local soldiers or people from the local populations to protect their own areas and now they vary from culture to culture to people to people because some areas like if, for those of you that know london for example um, is, is a big city but then if you go to somewhere like um, i don't know um, to Devon, which is the south of England. I mean, that's not a big city. And so the, the, the means and the tools you have in one city is very different than the means and tools you have in another part. And the Ottomans is the same. Some cities were urbanized city centers like London, and other areas were rural areas or villages. And so each area had a different mechanism as a way of protecting itself. It was only when um, they couldn't protect themselves that it was demanded that soldiers were sent from Istanbul. But can you imagine how difficult it is, in that sense, to, to maintain this? Yeah, so, so yeah, um, uh, um, as you rightly pointed out, the, the, the sort of like loss in that sense and, and, and the change that's happened in the Balkans is then, it, it's changed a different way in which the Europeans sort of like operate and so forth. So, uh, as we mentioned before, um, there's a recurring theme about the Janissaries, and the Janissaries had become part of the status quo, the status quo meaning they were now um, what was normal in that time, and any change to the Ottoman military would be a direct conflict on the Janissary themselves. And we spoke about this last week, right, the idea that the Janissaries, because the Janissaries were a standing army, but there was not enough funds for the Ottomans to be able to facilitate and pay for the Janissaries, that the Janissaries went into different means and mechanisms as a way of self-sustenance. But once that self-sustenance happened, they almost became semi-independent. And when you're as an institution, you, you have the ability to choose which Sultan comes into power and not. I mean, you can imagine how, how powerful you perceive yourself into being. And that's part of the problem and, and part of the danger. So in that sense, you can see now that the House of Osman had a particular concern and a, and, and a, and a challenge in regards to uh, the Janissaries in, in, in the sense of um, how do we, how do we ex expand or consolidate our authority and at the same time deal with this Janissary problem um, for them as the House of Osman, right? Um, and so you now see, to see a different uh, internal contestation. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So right, and this is the tulip era, so we're just going to quickly brush up on this. And the tulip era is known as, the reason why it's called tulip era is because this is the era in which um, tulips became very popular. Uh, as I said, it was a, it was a, you know, so actually, if any of you have been to Holland, the Netherlands, um, you will go to Holland and Netherlands, and one of the interesting things about Holland or the Netherlands is that you can find all sorts of tulips there. 
right? It's famous for, for their tulips and so forth. But one of the interesting things is, is that those tulips came from Istanbul initially, um, because tulips were so popular in Istanbul. And here in Istanbul, during the spring season, we have a tulip season where the whole of the city is like, you know, um, layered with, with tulips. And it comes from this period. And it's interesting that the tulips became a symbol of a particular cultural moment in Ottoman history, in which this was a moment of peace and exceptional intellectual expansion. So any of you who have gone to um, Topkapi Palace, um, outside the Topkapi Palace, there's a fountain. And it's really fascinating um, because that fountain, when you look at it in, in, in detail, and I think the Beatles uh, took a picture there. Um, it's a famous picture taken by the Beatles as well. And when you see that fountain, the, um, the calligraphy and the artwork is exceptional. It's a real interesting change um, from, from the artwork and the calligraphy of the period that come, come before. So this is a unique cultural and intellectual moment in, in Ottoman history, in that sense, yeah. Okay, so um, now what we start to see is a, a, a interesting change in the fortunes of the Ottomans, which is um, the, the mid and late 17th century, after the moment of peace. Um, so um, the word paradox is, how can I explain the word paradox to you? Paradox is something where, um, uh, in the sense that, um, I'm going to explain what I mean, and then maybe I can help you understand what the word paradox is. So there's the thing called the paradox of war. The paradox of war means people um, don't want to go to war because war is dangerous and war is bloody and so forth. And war is taxing, it's exhausting and occupying. But the armies that are constantly in war are the ones who are best at it because they're constantly in the state of war, if you know what I mean. So those nations who are not in moments of war, in their moments in peace, they're naturally going to fall behind. They're going to fall behind because they're not in the activity of war. So in that sense, while the Ottomans were in moments of peace, because they needed that moment of peace to consolidate authority, at the same time, the, other, the Western powers, the European powers and the Russians, were in periods of war. And because they were in periods of war, it sort of helped them to improve their tactical efforts, their weapons, their and the facilities and so forth. And then what happens is the Russians start to expand their domains into Ottoman territory. And the Ottomans face a series of losses against the Russians. In the past, the Ottomans' main threat, if you want to call it that, were the Safavids and the Austrians and local principalities in the Balkans and the Byzantines and so forth. But once the Russians became a threat, and the Russians were an entity in of themselves, um, and a large entity of that, I think the Ottomans were now uh, facing a formidable foe in, in, in that sense. And so what we start to see is, is the Russians, um, I can't show you the map, but the Russians are coming from the east and the west, right? And this is what the Ottomans are finding hard in that context. Um, um, and the Balkans, um, it's almost like a pincer activity where the Ottomans are stuck. How do they maneuver their troops? And um, the Ottomans lost the Khanate of Crimea in, uh, in 1774, which fundamentally changes everything. It's the first time Muslim territory has, has been lost, and it really shakes the Ottomans in terms of their ability to be able to protect Muslims. And uh, it really created a shock in the system. And the main shock in the system was, was that um, not only was the territory lost, but many Muslims from the Russian territories were migrating to Istanbul. Um, and they, they, they changed the, the sort of like dynamics of Istanbul. And what's intriguing is while local Ottoman elites wanted to transform their military gradually, the Muslims who had come from the Russian territories had a sense of far more urgency in wanting to speed up the reformation process because they had been at the receiving end of the Russians. And the people that came to Istanbul from the Russian territories in particular were Muslim Russian elites, right? So they were telling Istanbul, listen, you've got to do this fast, you've got to do it like this, and if you don't, we're going to get pasted by the Russians. So you have, on the one hand, an external force, which is compromising the Ottomans, and then an internal contestation of how change should be made, with, on the one hand, the old guard saying, no, this is our domains, this is how we're going to do it, and a new guard who are aware of the Russian threat 
we want a new change that's taking place. This doesn't only happen in, in that sense, and then you have Napoleon who uh, invades Egypt. And the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt is another indication of, of, of the Ottomans inability to protect the Muslim domains. And this now sends shockwaves um, into the Ottoman structure. And this is why, and we'll talk about this later, you then have the Wahhabi revolt. Because for the Wahhabis in particular, they have this notion or this idea of the Ottomans' inability to protect the Muslim domains, right? So this is what's happening in this sense. So the Ottomans, um, we can go back here. So the, the Treaty of Kutuk Kainarja then is the first time the Ottomans signed a treaty with the Russians. And what they do is they, they say to the Russians that, okay, look, we're, the war's going to stop, the end of hostilities. The Russians then say that we should have the right to protect Muslims, I mean, sorry, Christians in the, in, in the Ottoman domains. And if the Ottomans had treat any of the Orthodox Christians negatively, that the, the Russians can intervene. In return, um, many of the Muslims would leave the, the Crimea of Russia. Those who stayed would remain loyal to the Russians would be forced to remain loyal to the Russians. The Ottomans were allowed to, to, to choose the Grand Mufti of the Crimea, and he and the Ottomans would be perceived as a caliphate by the Muslims. And so for the first time, you have Muslims outside of the Ottoman domains now who have to um, who will bear their allegiance to Istanbul as being a caliphate. The reason why the Ottomans probably signed this treaty in this way was so that they might have believed that in the future they would go back and take it back. That's one. The second thing is, is that the, to, to recognize to all the other provinces that you, your loyalty is to Istanbul, where caliphate, okay? So that it's, this doesn't encourage like separatist behavior in other parts of the Ottoman domains in that sense. Uh, that, that is another possibility of why they did that. But it was unparalleled for the first time that um, a non-Muslim entity in writing accepts the Ottomans as a Khilafah. This hadn't happened before. But the Ottomans were on the weaker side of the um, of the diplomatic part. And, and, and this was a huge uh, blow for the Ottomans in many ways in this context. What's intriguing though is that the Ottomans were fortunate as well because the rise, the French Revolution in particular, not only creates tensions in France and the revolution goes for a long period of time, but the emergence of that is Napoleon and the Napoleonic invasions of, of Russia, in that sense, right? So this is what we got. Mona Saman, did you have a question? Because your, your mic was on and... No, no, sorry, it's fine. Okay, um, Reis has a question, then I have a question. But Reis is asking, how did Islam reach Russia? I feel it didn't reach Russia specifically. This is more the Crimean Tatars, right? Or Yeah, so um, Russia is really unique, uh, Reis. You know, one of the interesting things that we not only do I get frustrated about the lack of understanding of Islamic history regarding the Ottomans, but we really have a poor understanding of Islam's space in Russia, okay? And what we're talking about is, you remember we, we a few weeks back, we spoke about Timorlane and so forth. So um, Islam's presence um, in what you would call Asia proper is has, has been there for a very long time. So Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, the Uyghurs in China. Remember that the, the, today's modern China is 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 a manifestation of the emergence of the like communist China that came about during the Cold War period. But you know, um, prior in the 19th century, up until the 19th century, up until World War One, um, the, the the China you're seeing today was not that type of China. And it's the same thing with 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 Russia. I mean, all these Muslim entities become merged into the Soviet Union after the expansion of communist Russia. But so Islam's presence regarding the Russians, um, they have been interacting with Islam for a very long time in, the, um, in that sense. And there's been, you know, and just to, to go on this one, you know, even today, the Russians are well aware that the Muslim presence now, even in St. Petersburg and Moscow, is increasing, not necessarily via conversion, but because of the migration from these Turkic areas, from these ex-Soviet unions to St. Petersburg and Moscow for people looking for work. So um, a lot is changing in that sense. Just a final point before you move on. I mean, this is the first moment we start to see, is, is this the birth of the capitulations or um, negative capitulations? Because there were capitulations before, but now Russians have power 
to control things within the Ottoman domains and the French and the yeah. British. So Ottoman historians are reluctant to call it capitulations, and it's because, I mean, yes, the Ottomans are losing particular wars against the Russians, but on the same token, uh, the Ottomans then do get the acting gear and they are um, trying to strengthen their military. And I'll give an example. Um, it's like looking at today's Liverpool. I mean, they won the Champions League two seasons ago and lost the league by one point. And last season they won the league. And all of a sudden a car crash in defence. And what's happened, right? And But that doesn't mean that next season, if, if those players don't get fit and you don't buy new players, that Liverpool won't challenge for the title again. So the point I'm trying to make is this backwards and forwards. And the, the way that we look at the history of nations, peoples, and so forth is the backwards and forwards. The way to look at Ottoman history is better in terms of a backwards and forwards. The problem is, is that when we study um, Omeyyad history and Abbasid history, because their reign in comparison to the Ottomans was so short, we present those periods as birth, incline, decline, collapse. Um, but the Ottomans are around for 600 years. And the way they're doing it is reinvention, winning wars, losing wars, losing territories, expand, expanding territories. So I give an example, we'll talk about this later, but when the Ottomans lose part of the Balkans um, during the period of Mahmud II, Mehmed Ali Pasha conquers Sudan and he conquers Eritrea and you know parts of Ethiopia. So on the one hand, you lose a part, but on the other hand, they extended a part. During the reign of Abdul Hamid, they lose the Balkans, but what Yemen once again becomes part of the Ottoman domains, right? So it, what we say is the shifting borders. This is the harder part. But there's no denying that this is a period where the Russians were on top militarily as regard to a regional power, and the Ottomans needed to get the act in order fast. But it's difficult to know whether this is the beginning of the end. When you look at it from a linear perspective, you can like link these together, but yeah. Um, Okay, so Tipu Sultan, so the, 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 the um, Sultan at the time was Abdul Hamid I. And um, one of the interesting things is um, Tipu Sultan had asked Abdul Hamid I for some assistance in regards to the Ottoman troops because he felt that he had the, the Tipu Sultan, is the, the, the Sultan of Mysore, um, and he felt that he had the, um, uh, the British on the back foot. And I don't know if you guys have watched this. When I was a child, long time ago but um, channel 4 had a, a they had a series called the sword of tipu sultan and it was done by um the brother there was a famous bollywood actor his name was feroz khan and it was done by his brother um and um it's interesting because it was one of the first times in indian television that muslims were portrayed in a positive light in a television series uh, you know, so usually when you watch Bollywood or when you watch um, Indian television series and so forth, you will see that Muslims are usually um, terrorists or Muslims are secular Muslims, never religious. They're secondary characters or there's a nominal character like a taxi driver or, you know, a, a side actor who's just a Mr. Nice Guy. But never did they have depict uh, Muslims in, in terms of in this positive way. And the sort of Tipu Sultan was one of the first TV shows when I remember watching, which created this imagination of who Tipu was. And so Tipu is a very important and significant figure in, in the history of Islam, in the history of India, in that sense. And Tipu would ask Sultan Abdul Hamid I for help and assistance um, in, in, in that way. And what unfortunately happened is Abdul Hamid said, I cannot send any troops to you. And now that we understand Ottoman history, you can see why he couldn't send troops to him, because he was um, occupied by the um, uh, what you would call the Russian threat. I mean, in 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 many ways, um, the Ottoman troops were were not um, modernized, if you can call it that, or reformed enough to be able to compete with the type of threat that um, that both the Ottomans and Tipu were facing. And uh, in that sense, um, there was a need to um, to improve their military forces. And unfortunately, Abdul Hamid uh, turned down. Um, Tipu's request, but uh, um, he was willing to uh, send money. Uh, in and I think when we talk about history today, and uh, you know, many people will disagree with me right now, but you know, even politics today, when we see our states, uh, um, their inability to help Muslims around the world, it's an indication of, of in, in that context, it's not it's the same.
Okay, I was just about to ask that because because it's um, it's a recurring theme from now on till the end of the Ottoman Empire is the idea that Muslims around the world will call out for help and the Ottomans are unable you to know, be able to. In all fairness, it's not just a thing from the Ottoman period. This is a thing from throughout Islamic history. We we we. I'm not trying to make the direct comparison, but even during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, for example, when mm. Muslims were turned away at, at the moment of the signing of the treaty, and, and you know, the Sahaba were just like, like flabbergasted that this could happen in this sense. And it's because at, t at times um, your means and, and your, your ability have to be taken into consideration. Omar bin Khattab has also made the case during his Khilafah that he could only protect the people within his own domains. Yeah. In that sense, and I, I think that's um, that's not to say that I'm trying to um, to give a green light to Muslim leaders to abandon their fellow Muslims around the world. But what I'm trying to, I guess, highlight because I did political science is that that there is sometimes um, we have to understand that there's an inability for some of these states to be able to reach out in the current situation that we're in. I don't think that they want to do that anyway. And that's a different argument. But also that there's sometimes um, we're, we're, we're demanding too much from them, unfortunately. I don't think they have the, the means to do that. So after the death of Abdul Hamid, and actually it's interesting, uh, they, they say that Abdul Hamid actually died of a heart attack um, because of um, uh, just the, the, how distraught he had become um, of his inability to... Um, to protect Muslims. And Abdul Hamid the first was known as the pious Sultan. So we always remember Abdul Hamid the second as the pious Sultan. But even um, Abdul Hamid the first is, is known as the, the pious Sultan in many ways. And, um, you know, the shock to him and to the Ottomans was huge. And so when Selim comes to power, Selim the third, Selim the third is known as the, the Mujaddid. And the reason why he's known as the Mujaddid is because to some degree it was during his period that there is an attempt of Ottoman um, reform, okay? And there's a debate that's taking place in Istanbul at the time in terms of we, we need to strengthen the House of Osman because the House of Osman is the Khilafah and in that sense, um, yes, the Mujaddid is the reviver. And it's intriguing, this narratives of the Mujaddid is intriguing because different people, different ulama have different opinions of who can be a Mujaddid. So for those of you who know, Al-Ghazali is perceived as a mujaddid, right? So some people argue that the reviver of Islam would be an alim. Other people argue that the reviver of Islam would be somebody from a, from a Sufi background, as a, or a sheikh or so forth. And other people have argued that the reviver can be a political leader um, um, and so forth. I, I'm reluctant to, to, to call anyone in today's day and age from the political class a mujaddid. Um, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't think that's the case necessarily in today's politics that we have in Mujaddid in the political class. But nonetheless, you know, um, this is an issue of opinion and ishtihad and Muslims will always find ways of, of saying, okay, this looks like the, the revival of that sense. But it was necessary for Selim in particular to be perceived as a Mujaddid at least because um, in many ways there were too many obstacles in the way of the Ottomans to reform the military uh, class in, in, in some, some ways. Imran Khan, I don't know if Imran Khan is a Mujaddid, but if, if it makes you happy, it, 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 uh, you know, yeah, we, we can vote that. But, you know, so, and, and, and so we start to see the emergence of the verse in the Quran, which is obey Allah, obey the messenger, and those in authority from amongst you. And the, the, the key thing is here is to highlight the strength of the Ottoman Sultan as the Khalifa. So the, uh, the Ottoman self-reflection is as was that because um, the Janissaries, the ulama, uh, the Grand Vizier and these institutions and the local leaders in the various places were um, was semi-independent and the House of Osman was weak. This is one of the reasons why we were unable to defeat the Russians. And we need a far more authoritarian system where the buck stops with one person and we need the Khalifa to be strong again. And so Selim was, was projected as that Khalifa in that context. And then, then what we start to see is a huge contestation of whether the Khalifa should be uh, absolutely strong or not. And the reason why um, some Muslims were concerned with 
with the Khalifa being an absolute power because they felt that if the Khalifa became an absolutist, the possibility of Islam becoming corrupted in the hands of one person was far more dangerous. So once again, you see this difference of opinion, right? And these different, what I would call um, political cultures that exist within the Islamic system. So one of the things that you learn in, in Islam is that Islam is not necessarily obsessed with the style of governance. Islam has the ability to, to basically um, nurture a shorter based system or a more authoritarian based system. But what Islam is more important um, concerned with is that the people who are applying these laws and who are people of people of authority that they're ethical, they're moral, and they're upright. So irrespective of the system, which can go from one to another, and these are just um, intellectual ideas, what's far more important is the ability to hold those people in power to account. And the Ottomans are calling this, because this is the period where we, know, we start to see the Ottomans calling for justice, right? And the idea of, of in that context. Okay, he says, did the Ottomans not have the equivalent thinking of the divine rights of kings? They did have a similar idea of that, actually. They did. Um, and this is what the, the, the concern is, is that um, some ulama made the case that they're not divine in this sense, yeah? And this is why exactly um, some ulama made the case that they were like the, the, the shadow of Allah Ta'ala on earth. Other ulama made the case that they're the shadow of uh, Rasul Salam on earth. Um, in this case, and then the explanation of what it means to be a shadow. But once again, um, some ulama argued that if the Sultan as Caliph was an absolute power, that anyone who has absolute authority is going to abuse it. And the word that they use is mustabid. Okay, the mustabid or istibdad um, is the person who um, is uh, an absolute authoritarian. And the concern is in the Ottoman context is whether it's an institution, whether it's a person, whether it's the ulama, whether it's a khalifa, is that if one institution, one group of people, or one person has too much power, it's impossible for them to be just, because power is corrupting. And that the only entity that can have absolute power and be just is Allah and nobody else. And so this is why there are mechanisms within the Islamic culture that we see in this period in Ottoman history debating about the permissibility of one person having absolute power, i.e. in this case the Khalifa. So this is the point I'm making, which is that there's some people believe that he, as the Khalifa, he should have the absolute power because he's a Khalifa, you know, he's a representative of Islam in the dunya, whereas other people argued that this is problematic because it raises other questions. And this is what I wanted to raise to you guys. I know you're young, but I just want you to think about this because it's interesting like that we do have a moment in, in a period in Islamic history that, that sort of like looks into this in terms of the prerogatives of those in power and authority which we don't talk about anymore unfortunately my argument has been the fickle, fickle siyasa ended after the collapse of the Ottomans so prior, during the Ottoman period you still have a fickle siyasa you have a fickle politics but now the fickle politics is gone um, after the collapse of the Ottomans and then now there's a fear of, of even talking about politics from the Fiqhi perspective in this context. So Selim wants to make military change, and unfortunately Selim is assassinated by the Janissaries, right? And um, for him. And so what you get is you have what they call a revolutionary moment. And, and so Mustafa is the one who's in power, but then there's a revolt against him, and Mahmoud II um, is the one who comes with. Yeah, so as I mentioned, though, you see, the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt is important. Because in some ways, the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt sort of undermines uh, Selim's credibility of being the Mujaddid. And it undermines his ability, credibility as Khalifa to be able to protect the Muslims. So once again, you know, we have this complicated situation with, um, with the Ottomans in that sense, uh, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, yeah. Um, but Napoleon doesn't stick around for long, in fairness to him. Um, but um, he has more pressing concerns. But his in intervention in Egypt is devastating. And one of the interesting things that Napoleon did, which I think all Muslims need to understand, when Napoleon came to Egypt, he brought historians with him. He brought historians with him to teach the Egyptians what their history ought to be. And this is important to understand this, that Muslims today are still being told and educated in terms of what their history ought to be. You know, 
um, by outside. And this is why I want you to, to study your own history and understand it better. Okay. So Mahmoud II um, is the Sultan who comes into power. And as you can see, Mahmoud is in power for 31 years. Mahmoud learns from Selim's mistakes. Selim tries to change the Ottoman domains and reform the military slowly, slowly, right? And what Mahmoud will, I mean, quickly, sorry. So he, he tries to do it in a way where he tries to keep everyone happy. And Mahmoud is like, you know what, this is not going to work. So he uses a more divide and conquer strategy, which is that he goes after small factions slowly, slowly. The first thing he does is with the help of the Janissary in particular, he encourages the Janissary and his new forces to um, sort of um, crush the autonomous um, leaders in the Balkans, to centralize the Balkans under his watch. So that's the first thing he attempts to do. He wants to streamline it. And the Balkans are interest, important for them, as we mentioned, because the Ottomans are a Rumeli empire, firstly, um, and the you know, domains, shall I say. And the second thing is, is that the, um, the, the majority of the material resources in which the Ottomans um, enjoyed the most were from the Balkan regions. It was not from the Arab regions or from Anatolia. The, the more um, economically vibrant areas in the Ottoman domains were from the Balkans. Um, but also, um, a lot of the, 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 the military men and armed forces came from two main areas, which was Anatolia and the Balkans. So Mahmoud went to um, centralize that. The second thing he did in Anatolia, which is Turkey, is he attempted to, he, um, there were large families, powerful families that, that had their own militia and so forth. And he went around confiscating their properties as a way of making, basically removing them from the po political power structures locally and uh, taking their estates and uh, so forth. And he even started confiscating waqfs from the ulama as a way of regulating the funds so that he can strengthen the state, state treasury. Now this once again becomes problematic because to some degree people make the argument that the waqf or the awqaf should be independent from the jurisdiction of the authority, which is the Khalifa in power. And yet uh, Mahmoud is making the case that because he's the Khalifa and everyone should be obedient to him, that the interest of the Dawla, the Devlet, is more important than the interest of, of, of the Waqfs in that sense, and that money is needed and required to streamline his, um, his state in a way in which he can improve his military and protect the Devlet. Now you can once again see this contestation that's taking place in this sense. Many people, in, in fairness, are critical of Mahmoud's move in this sense. It's, it's, it's not seen positively in, 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 in many ways. So um, this is part of the problem uh, in that sense. Now, while Mahmoud is, is going around um, gradually centralizing his domains, but in a very aggressive fashion, marginalizing those people who were his allies, but now have become his enemies, um, in many ways, we see the rise of the Naqshbandis. And the Naqshbandi Tariqa are very unique in the, in the manner in which they sort of like um, have become quite prominent in, 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 in Turkey and in Istanbul in particular, but even in Damascus, Aleppo, uh, Baghdad. So uh, I, I'm sure uh, none of you have been to Syria because you would be too young. But when I was in Syria, there was a, um, a tomb of a, a uh, Sheikh Khalid, who was a Mojaddid Naqshbandi uh, um, Sheikh, um, and it was really fascinating because he was buried in a place called Rukn Adin in someone's house. I mean, it was his house, but when he died, he was buried in the courtyard. And what was fascinating, and we all joke about this, that you could knock on that person's door any time of the day, and he would open it for you. And people would knock on his door at 12 at night, people would knock on his door at in the morning and the, it was really fascinating that he would open the door he would give you tea and and uh, and, and the people would do you know some people do zikr some people would do fatiha some people would just come to see and it was very unique for me to see that when i was living in syria and that there was a tradition of maintaining a a sort of a remembrance of the naqshbandis in particular in bilad sham and in anatolia so the naqshis in this sense the, 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 the interesting thing about them is their, their ability to be in close proximity to power. And they started influencing a particular mood in Istanbul, which was a mood on reform, a mood on um, uh, adherence to the Sharia, a mood on maintaining the notion of justice 
and the idea of morals and ethics coming from the sunnah um, in, in that context. Um, yeah. Mahmoud Ali. Okay, sorry, yeah, I didn't see. So, so once Mahmoud is um, basically um, deco you know, centralizing his domains aggressively, and what he does in 1829 is he abolishes the Janissaries. And as we mentioned before, the Janissaries are age-old Ottoman institution. They've been around since the beginning of the Ottomans, right? And um, with the help of the ulama signing away a couple of fatwas, um, the way that Mahmoud was able to defeat the Janissaries was that his new army, in many ways, um, had heavy artillery. And so they had weapons that the Janissaries did not have. And they just blitzed the Janissaries in Istanbul in a way that had been unheard of. And the Janissaries were eventually abolished. Now, a lot of people, historians, talk about the Janissaries just being massacred and slaughtered and so forth. I think that's more to do with um, creating an imagination about the Janissaries um, as a way of striking fear in the hearts of people who, who would have thought about um, reinventing the Janissaries. In reality, many of the Janissary soldiers would have just become regular soldiers in the new army. They would have been um, assisted into just making that transition and incorporated in the new army. But what happens is uh, Mehmed Ali Pasha from Egypt is now seeing what's happening, right? And he's seen what's happening in regards to, uh, to Istanbul. He sees what's happening in regards to the killing of other um, local leaders. He's seen the confiscations. He's seen the abolishment of the Janissaries, and so he reacts to that and responds to that. And he goes into conflict with Mahmoud II, and it's a huge contestation. And um, basically the contestation nearly brings the Ottomans to its knees. And um, uh, Mehmed Ali Pasha basically makes the threat that if the, uh, if the Sultan does not stop, that he would walk his way to Istanbul and basically uh, take out the, the, the Sultan, but replace him with another Sultan. There are some Ottoman historians in Turkey who are under the pressure that Mehmed Ali Pasha wanted to be Khalifa. Um, and he was a strong leader, but uh, the evidence doesn't seem to support that. The evidence seems to support of Mehmed Ali Pasha wanted uh, to remove uh, the Mahmoud II and replace him with his son, Abdul Majid uh, I. With, so, with the Mehmet Ali Pasha case, I mean, what's interesting about this is Mahmoud can't fight him off. So he calls in the Europeans to fight for yeah. him, right? Yeah, this is interesting. So um, Mehmet Ali Pasha, um, uh, because, okay, so we need to backtrack um, a little bit, which was that when Napoleon invaded Egypt, and then when Napoleon left, he left a political vacuum in Egypt. And when Mehmet Ali Pasha was sent by Istanbul to Egypt, he became the go-to guy. Um, for the Ottomans in Egypt to um, deal with the crisis in Egypt. Not only did he become the go-to guy in that sense, what Mehmed Ali Pasha then did is he streamlined the Egyptian military under the lines of the French model, is what's been argued. That Mehmed Ali Pasha saw that the way that the French regiments were, were organized, the way the French regiments were fighting, and that the Muslim armies were, were more ragtag in many ways. And so he improves his military, mainly from the Balkans, he's the soldiers that come over, but then he needs a local military. He then expands into Sudan, uh, he, um, takes in a lot of the people from the peasantry, from Egypt and Sudan, to be part of his new military force. Um, he's successful for the Sultan in the Balkans, and he's also successful in, for the Sultan in defeating the Wahhabis uh, in many ways. And so his military unit is a supreme military force in many ways. And um, the Wahhabis who had occupied the Hijaz and then um, also occupied the area of Najaf and Karbala um, and stopped people from going on the Hajj um, became very troublesome for not only the Ottomans in regards to um, taking rebellion against them, but also for undermining their caliphate, their Khilafah. So as a result of that, um, Mahmoud's troops um, firstly would have to travel a long way from Istanbul or from the Balkans to uh, the Hejaz, but secondly his troops were still not, um, we can say, um, uh, reformed enough to be able to take on an assault in that terrain, which is a terrain of desert. But Mehmed Ali Pasha's army, which was a lot closer to him being in Egypt, him being very loyal to Istanbul, 
and him streamlining his military um, in in Egypt was able to go to the Hijaz, which is yes, you, you might in Mecca Mecca, Medina. We call this this area is called Hijaz. It still is called Hijaz, um, and he defeated the Wahhabis in uh, in brutal fashion and 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 uh, obliterated them in many ways. Uh, returns back to Egypt. So now all of this has happened. So Mehmed Ali Pasha, who feels like he's loyal to Istanbul, he can't quite understand why is it that Mahmoud II is going after him. I think he knows because Mahmoud wants to centralize the domains, but he doesn't want to be the next victim. So, you know, um, in that sense, um, he goes to war with Istanbul. And what's fascinating is European historians make the case that the reason why Mehmed Ali Pasha was successful over Mahmoud II is because his army was more modernized. But actually, we've been looking at the evidences more and more, and it seems it wasn't that necessarily his army was more modernized, it was that the Muslims in the Ottoman army were refusing to fight Mehmed Ali Pasha. That they had become exhausted and tired from the policies of Mahmoud II, and that they, when Mehmed Ali Pasha was, was turning up, they were just putting down their weapons. And they were saying, you know what, well, we, we don't want this. And it's, also, I guess the Muslims just didn't want an internal contestation. And Mahmoud II freaking out, and the British and the, you know, and Mahmoud thinking, I have very few options. He turns to the Russians of all people. The whole point of the reformation process of the military was to restrict Russian encroachment. And yet what Mahmoud does is he does the, the, the unthinkable and he turns to the Russians, mainly because the Russians are closer uh, in proximity, and that he feels that if he can just get the Russians to um, to to restrict Mehmed Ali Pasha, once Mehmed Ali Pasha is defeated, he can just then the Russians will just go back. But um, that was uh, maybe a miscalculation on his part, and the French and the British got nervous that this possibility could happen, so they stepped in. And it was they instead who defeated uh, Mehmed Ali Pasha's advance uh, in doing so. Um, they compromised the Ottoman state in a way which was unthinkable. And Mahmoud II then signs a treaty, um, the Baltelemana Treaty, with the, um, it's not on the slide, um, uh, with the British. as a way, uh, And they say this is, I don't know because I'm not an economic historian, but they make the case that this was a, the Ottoman introduction to capitalism in some ways, or uh, the, the capitalist world, right? Fortuitously, um, Mahmoud II dies uh, a year later. Now, we don't know whether Mahmoud II died from natural causes or whether he was poisoned. Um, Allah knows best. But the narrative is, is that he died of natural causes. And his young son, who Mehmed Ali Pasha wanted, 18-year-old Abdul Majid, um, becomes the new sultan of the Ottoman domains, and it's a it's a it's a changing of a moment in Ottoman history, known as the Tanzimat, which means the period of reform. Okay, and the period of reform, and so what happens in 1839 is that the document called the Gulhane Treaty, and the Gulhane Treaty is um, wait, you know what? I should stop here and give you guys. Do you want to ask a question, anyone? Man, I've, I've been going on today. I'm sorry about that. Are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Anything that they want to ask before we move on? Um, we do. Obviously, it's the 300-year period that we're trying to cover today, so that's why there is going to be um, quick movement. But, I mean, Khan, you guys must have a question about the Wahhabis, at least. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why did Napoleon invade Egypt? Okay. Uh... So it's just basic expansionism. It's, it's just uh, Napoleon saw himself as, as an emperor and there was an opportunity, but also because I think he wanted access to the, to the, to the, Med, the Mediterranean Sea, right? So the Egypt, I mean, you know, um, we don't realize this right now, but um, the Balkans was very important for the Ottomans, but in terms of a intellectual and economic center, Alexandria and Cairo were just as important as Istanbul. In those days, Alexandria and Cairo were really significant um, cities for the Ottomans in regards to trade, in regards to being port cities, 
in regards to being cities that connect the the the, the, um, the south of Europe to the north of Africa. Um, these were um, really significant, and Napoleon recognized that. What Napoleon couldn't do after his invasion of Egypt was he couldn't keep his troops there. He had the inability to do that. So that was it. So what are the Wahhabis? Were they like the Sufi Tariqats? Um, he, okay, so the Wahhabis are, how can I explain? They're not like the Sufi Tariqats. So the Wahhabis are a, a, a group of Muslims who have a different um, vision of Islam from South, what we call today Saudi Arabia, but the Hijaz region, in which they were critical of Sufism in many ways. And their criticism of, of Sufism led them to a, a version of Islam which was critical of the Ottomans because obviously um, the, um, the, the Ottomans were perceived as being a Sufi caliphate in many ways. And they emerged as a reformist movement. So it's interesting, just like how the Naqshbandis emerge as a Sufi tariqat of a reformist order, the, um, the Wahhabis emerge as a reformist movement um, which are, um, have a very um, rejection, rejectionist approach towards Sufism in some ways. And so they come from a different particular um, intellectual framework and um, they they, their position regarding the Ottomans is quite harsh and um, quite um, radical in many ways, in which they reject the Ottomans as even being Muslim. And so as a result of that, um, conditions on the ground, their local conditions on the ground, in, in the fact that they felt that they should be in charge of the, um, the, the Hijaz region, and their intellectual reformism in rejection to the Ottoman version or understanding of Islam, meant that um, they became a very aggressive force as a result of that. And the Ottomans, um, as a way of uh, defeating them, then sell, sent Mehmed Ali Pasha to defeat them. And the uh, Wahhabis didn't rise or come back into the, the political sphere until the collapse of the Ottomans. So up until the collapse of the Ottomans, then they were marginalized and kept into a, a, a corner. And as I told you before, there are various movements and peoples that emerge of what you would call um, particular forms of, um, I can't think of another word, but conservatism, unfortunately, in, throughout Islamic history. I mean, we see this period is also the rise of Salafism, but the early Salafis are still very different than the Wahhabis. This um, merging takes place a lot later on. There are some commonalities that Wahhabi thinkers and ulama have in common with Salafi thinkers, but the, the rise of the Salafiya movement in Bilad Sham in Egypt was still a very different movement. And so what, I'm, what we start to see then is multiple forms of different types of Muslims who, who are emerging from their local conditions and their, what you would call global Ottoman conditions of trying to um, address what they perceive as the problems in the Muslim world and in the Ottoman domains in relation to the encroachment of the Western powers, right? I think in the Wahhabi case, that's their threat. They don't see the Western powers as a threat per se. For them, they're very localized and probably see the Ottomans as a bigger threat. But for the Salafi movement and the Naqshbandi movement in particular, they they see um, a sort of um, a emergence of uh, the, the sort of like Protestantization that's taking place within the knowledge base that's coming from these Western powers, and they want to address them and deal with them in many ways, which creates um, new um, sort of like um, new ways of thinking in, in some ways. I'm, 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 and I'm trying to be fair to everyone in that sense, you know, um, in the way of explaining it. Well, Star has been very nice. I mean, I think um, in a rather more scathing critique of the Wahhabis. Um, I mean, by, by, in terms of what the ulama at the time said, they saw oh, yeah, them no, as... So, yeah, you're right. I mean, look, personally, um, I, I'm a person who, who who's reluctant to to go down that route. No, of course, I recognise that at the time, this is fair to say that the ulama at the time were exceptionally critical of the Wahhabi movement. In fact, the Ottoman punishment towards the Wahhabis was very excessive, in the sense of trying to make the the case that this sort of activity should never have happened and should never happen. 
in that. Uh. Um, and um, the, if you read any of the literature at the time, there is a lot of condemnation from uh, Muslims from around the world in terms of what had happened. And, and, and people uh, stopped from going on the Hajj and things like that. I mean, in terms, and, and they killed thousands of people because they claimed that they weren't really Muslim. Yeah, um, so there, a, a lot of, uh, yes, you're right. A lot of this sort of activity happened. I don't know about the numbers, but this sort of activity does happen. And this is what shocks the Ottomans. Actually, the Ottomans, you know, it's really bizarre. They, they sort of swallow the pill when um, Mecca and Medina are sort of like um, taken over. Where the Ottomans really go into action is when the Wahhabis start killing people in Najaf and Karbala. That's weird. Yeah, for them, it's like, yes, and look, they, 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 you know, it's not that the Ottomans didn't want to take Makkah and Medina back, but they're still a little bit patient. Um, but when people were being killed in Najaf and Karbala, this was very problematic for the Ottomans because the Ottomans wanted to be perceived as guardians of all forms of Muslims in, in their domains, right? They didn't want to be seen as people who, who were marginalizing anyone. And by doing that, um, it really undermined the Ottoman authority in regards to what was happening in, in, in the East and in terms of British intervention. And they just said, you know what, right, this is going to stop now and we've got to step in. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I guess we could just move on, really, because we've only got in sense of time. Yeah. So um, what we see is uh, the edict of the Gulhane edict being uh, professed. And the Gulhane edict is, 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 is a real shift in Ottoman political culture in the sense that what it does is it, um, for the first time, it represents a, a, what you can call a shift in Ottoman political thinking in which there's a debate taking place between society and the ruler. And what this document does is it forces Mehmed Ali Pasha to retreat to Istanbul. And what it also does is it makes the case that all Ottoman subjects are equal in the eyes of the law. And what it also does is it says that uh, everyone's property, uh, life and religion should be put, and intellect should be protected. And for those of you who don't know, um, these are the ideas of the Makassid al-Sharia. And it's intriguing that the Ottomans had, had somehow put this into a documentation. Now, the reason why this is important for us as Muslims is because a lot of the early Ottoman academics said that the Gulhane was a document that was inspired by the ideals of the French Revolution. And yet now Ottoman historians are recognizing that this was a document that wasn't necessarily inspired by the French Revolution, but was by, inspired by the culture and ideas of Islam itself, right? And, and, and a lot of times, um, many Ottoman historians who were Eurocentric were making the case that the Ottomans were just using Islam as an instrument. But now Ottoman historians are accepting the fact that the Ottomans, Islam meant something very important to them and it was deeply ingrained in their system. And from this moment onwards, you see the Tanzimat, the Mahmud, like him or love him, he had centralized the domains, which made it easier for the Ottomans to become a provincial system, a more bureaucratic state. The Ottomans, however, needed money to, to create educational reforms and military reforms. And so they borrow money from the, the French and the British banks. In doing so, the whole process that they would pay the loans off once they reformed their domains, but they fell into humongous amounts of debt which was problematic for them. People always ask me, um, like, you know, why didn't they, um, uh, you know, uh, use money uh, to their own money to improve their, their domains? The problem was, was the need to, um, to speed up their reform to compete with the European powers meant that they needed to have a system which was of the equivalent of the European powers. And the difficulty was, was that the Russians used autocracy, right? The Russians said, we're in power. And to the people, they just said, this is what we're gonna do, you're gonna accept it. Just like today's Russia and China. The Western powers used colonialism. Colon colonialism. They were colonizing countries, taking their resources, strengthening the state. But what could the Ottomans do? The Ottomans couldn't colonize countries like the European powers. So the only option they had left was to do what the Russians did. And so Mahmoud II tried what the Russians did and people got very upset. People said, this is un-Islamic. You can't do this to us. You can't treat us in this way. The ulama put pressure. And then what happens is Mehmed Ali Pasha moves against Istanbul and says, we're not gonna accept this. So you can see that the Ottomans are stuck between a rock and a hard place 
in trying to find the funds and means in a way to compete with the foreign powers. So it's almost like, you know, Liverpool trying to compete with Man City, who have like a country that owns them, or Chelsea, which has a billionaire that owns them, right? Or Man United, which is a corporate capitalist monster. Like, how do you compete with these institutions that use this? Now, you could copy them, but, you know, Liverpool don't have somebody of, of, of those na nature. So then you have to find a different way of doing it. And the Ottomans, unfortunately, uh, felt, and, you know, oh, we can't sell Salah. Maybe we can sell Salah. Um, you know, he, he's, he's, he's annoying with these days. Um, maybe, um, uh, in, in that sense, the Ottomans then borrowed money from the British and the French banks. Uh, to and uh, in the hope that they would pay it back, but this put them in exceptional amounts of debt. You're right. Sultan Abdulaziz visits you. Okay, Sultan Abdulaziz well, um, in in six seven visit you. He becomes the first Ottoman Sultan to visit Europe, and it's really fascinating. He takes um you know Abdul Hamid with him. In many ways, so Abdul Hamid uh, gets to see um, Europe. There is a suggestion. I don't know how true this is, um, but just for the interest of, of you guys who are Muslim. That Abdul Aziz might have gone on the Umrah or on the Hajj when he was not Sultan and that he went in disguise. Once again, this is just things we hear from the grapevine. There's no real evidence to prove that, but people are trying to find it. But Abdul Aziz went to Europe and Abdul Aziz was, I, I guess, a Sultan who wanted to show Europe that the Ottomans were a power and the Ottomans were a significant state, just like the European state. And the Ottomans were um, like a, um, how could I say, um, a cultural state and an intellectual state. And when he goes to Europe and he goes to Vienna and so forth, he takes a project with them to show them that the, there's going to be new forms of culture, art and architect architecture. Did I ever play you the music of Abdulaziz? You didn't hear that? Okay, let me, let, let me, let me see if I can find it for you. One sec. Um, okay, YouTube. Uh, Sultan uh, Abdul Aziz composition and um, okay, yeah. So that's an Android. Let's just get this Android to go away. Okay. So um, I want to show you another song, which um, is, so Abdul Aziz was a famous composer, um, and this was one of the songs he, he, he composed. Um, this was uh, uh, another one. Um, let me see if we can hear this one. So yeah, hey, hey, most have a bit of Star Wars. And you know what? Let me find you one, which is really interesting. Okay. Uh, one second. Um, this one. And I'll find you one more. Um, wait, see this one? Let me see. There's one famous one. Let me find it. Um, you hear this one? Let me check. No. 
Hold on, there's one thing, really interesting one I want you guys to listen to. You'll be shocked by it. Um, oh, where is it? Because, um, I think it's this one, let me see. Oh, is it? You know what the problem with Abdul Aziz's music on the internet is that it keeps getting taken down by YouTube um, for copyright reasons. Uh, I think it's this one. If it's not, then we'll move on. But um, let me check if it's this one. Um, oh, it's not there. But basically, there's a song. Uh, there's a um, there's a, a school um, music um, that goes. When I was a child, it was one, two, three, four, five. What I call the Fisher Life, six, seven. Okay, the original composition of that track was done by Sultan Abdulaziz, um, and it goes. So it's intriguing, like a song which we are synonymous with in regards to belonging to a nursery rhyme in England was actually a track that was composed by Sultan Abdulaziz. You know, in that sense, and there's a lot of things like this which the Ottomans did um, that um, are no longer in our memories in regards to um, the, uh, the Ottoman past. And Sultan Abdulaziz was a painter, a famous painter, and a famous, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, composer. And uh, he composed many songs in, in this way. And he composed music that was style in the Hijazi style, in the Turkish style, in the Western Star and in the Alhambra, um, what you call uh, the Andalusian star. So he was very uh, intrigued in these things. Yeah. And so when he went to Europe, this was his thing. Now, we go to Sultan Abdulaziz, as I mentioned to you before, he passes away or he, he's murdered or commits suicide. Um, the, the jury is still out on what happened. But this is known as the 76 is then known as a traumatic year of the three sultans. Um, the 76 is where Abdulaziz dies. And then Murad comes to power, and then Murad is is is, is claimed that Murad is, has gone insane, and then Sultan Abdul Hamid II comes to power, and the the whole contestation of of these three sultans in this year is a contestation of um, having an Ottoman constitution, right? And the con the idea of the constitution comes on the basis that. Um, there are many people who believe that the Ottoman political structure should be organized in a way in which if they had a constitution, then their state would be more efficient and then they would be able to compete with the Western powers, right? So we had military reform, we had educational reform, we had judicial reform, um, but one of the things that people want to see is there needs to be political reform. If there's a streamlining of politics, then we would have this. Okay, we can go to the... Um, and Abdul Hamid is in power for 33 years, which is long, probably the longest sultan in the latter period. So this is the constitution movement. Now, um, if you guys can see it, and uh, maybe, I don't know if you can zoom out, but this is uh, basically the front page of the Ottoman constitution written in Ottoman Turkish. So the front line says, Kanuna Isasi, okay, the fundamental law. And so I, I don't know if you guys have seen this before. I have a lot of friends who are Arabs, who when they see Ottoman Turkish for the first time, they get confused because um, obviously it looks like Arabic, but it's not Arabic, it's Turkish, right? And this, this is a, the Ottoman constitution that was written. The constitution became a constitutional caliphate with a parliament. And this was the first time it happened in Islamic history. Abdul Hamid closes it two years later, because when they opened the parliament, Abdul Hamid found it very difficult to operate as sultan in the parliamentary system, especially due to the wars that, um, they had the Russians, but it left the imprint in the minds of people, the imagination. It left it in their mind. Not only that, but in 1876, we have the movement, and this is really important for you guys who want to study Hanafi's law and Ulum al in particular, which was the Majelle. The Majelle was the first form of codified Hanafi fiqh regarding civil law and um, trade law in particular. And um, early Ottoman historians made the case that this book was... Um, was an emulation of, of, of European law. But when I was in Syria, I remember many of the ulama in Syria would make the case that the Majelli was from the Hanafi tradition. And Sami Ayyub, who Asim has studied under the Ihsan Academy, he 
he wrote a book, um, and I'm going to interview him in a few weeks' time, um, on making the case that the Majelle as a document was uh, from the Hanafi school. It came from the Hanafi school. But it's really interesting. The point I'm trying to make to you guys here is there's still a debate amongst historians about what was Islamic and what was not Islamic, you know, because I think Muslims are finding it very difficult to make sense of what belongs to the world of Islam and what doesn't, in that sense, because we live in a world of dichotomies where things need to be clear. This is Islamic, this is not Islamic. But um, in many ways, um, Islam is very fluid in its ability to embrace many things and ideas encompassing it within it, and uh, the Majalla was one of them. So Abdul Hamid's policies, as I said, were one of autocracy, Islam, conservatism and reform. And Abdul Hamid's main policy was an educational policy. And this was designed to gain loyalty to, um, well, it was one to, Abdul Hamid was concerned that Muslims were not getting, um, um, that the best educations were, were from people in the missionary schools in his, his domains. And that um, the level of Muslims in, in high ranking positions can only improve if the educational system improves. But he was doing something which was happening in other parts of the world as well. The Russians did the same, which was that the educational system would create loyal subjects to the Ottoman donor, the Ottoman devlet, right? Um, and in doing so, Abdul Hamid uh, made the case that Muslim loyalty was, was important to Istanbul as a center. Not only that, but uh, that um, Abdul Hamid started to proclaim an idea of global Muslim unity as a way of maintaining loyalty to the Khilafah. And this is for two reasons. The first is that Abdul Hamid wanted to maintain loyalty for Muslims within the Ottoman domains to the Khilafah. So he, the Khilafah was being used as a, um, you could say, I'm not meaning used as an instrument, but um, its authority was being exercised as a way of maintaining loyalty by Muslims within the Ottoman uh, 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 state. But also the Ottomans were projecting into the rest of the Muslim world that the Khilafah for the Ottomans was the only institution which was um, um, sort of um, rejecting and resisting Western hegemony, right? So other Muslim entities had been colonized and the Ottomans were not. So the institution of the Khilafah became interesting in the way of, of, of almost as an, as an idea of resistance to Western hegemony and as an idea of unity internally. It was very interesting to see in that sense of how it was presented and projected um, by the, the Hamidian state in particular. Another, but what you can see is that Abdul Hamid did a lot of activities for Muslims. And one of the interesting things he did was he, the, the, he, under him, the Hijaz railway station was built, which was fascinating. I lived in Syria and I saw one of the stations of the Hijaz railway in Syria. And I saw that we have um, railway stations here in Istanbul that were built really beautiful. Abdul Hamid um, um, has a very austere policy in, in the way that he uh, operates his domains and manages to pay back a lot of the loans that they had borrowed from the foreign powers. But wars with Russia and, and Greece really hurt the Ottomans in that sense. Um, there was an attempt by the Armenians to assassinate Abdul Hamid um, in, in many ways. Um, and you know what, um, Asim, let me, can I send you something? Um, one second, um, it's here. I'm gonna send you a link on, on WhatsApp maybe. And maybe you can you can show it to the to the kids. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, yeah, this one. You can't see it, but I'm going to send it to you now on WhatsApp. And if you can um, put it up, because I'm using my my um, my uh, laptop. Uh, my iPad. Okay, okay one second. Um, did you get it? Um, okay, here it is. Sorry. Uh, copy. And uh, okay, I've sent it to you. So can you can you check to see if you've got the link? 
and if you can post that. Um, I just want you guys to see this little video of the Hamidian period. It's a small video clip that not many people get to see. It's in Turkish, you don't need to listen to that, but uh, I want you to see some. Uh, Asim, we can't hear anything because you're on mute. Can you hear it now? Paris'te, Berlin'de, Rusya'da sinemalarda gösterime girdi. Film kataloğunda bir yaşam olarak etiketlenmiş. Gerçekten de burası Yıldız Camii. Gördüğümüz ise Sultan II. Abdülhamit'in Cuma selamlığı. Arşıklarından Şadiye Sultan böyle bir filmden bahseder. Padişah'ın kızlarından Şadiye Sultan böyle bir filmden bahseder. Genç, zarif ve dikkate şayan, ecnebi oluşu ilk bakışta anlaşılan biri garip bir makineyle resimler alıyordu der. Bu sahne çok anlamlı bir tarihte yaşanır. Meşrutiyetin ikinci cumasında 31 Temmuz 1908'de. Görevliler arasında bulunan Selim Sırrı Bey, garip makinenin ne olduğunu soran Şadiye Sultan'a şöyle söyler. Film alacak Sultan Efendi, resim kaydını alıyorlar. Bu müthiş günü çocuklarımıza da gösterebileceğiz. Yayın tarihine bakılırsa Şadiye Sultan'ın bahsettiği film büyük ihtimalle budur. Mişrutiyet Din ilk cuma selamı. One of the things I wanted to see in the video was this was a video of Sultan Abdul Hamid just after um, the, the Young Turk Revolution. And what you see here is for the first time Abdul Hamid was, um, it was very rare to see him come out in public. And I wanted you to see like the mosque, the Yildiz Jami, which is one of the mosques. It's the last Sultanic mosque in Istanbul. Um, it's beautiful. If any of you ever get the opportunity to come here, please see it. And you can see that, that when his visibility created a huge fanfare where people went out to see him. And one of the interesting things about the Juma was to project the notion of the Khilafah, to project the notion of Ittihad al-Islam, and, and showing the Muslim world in particular that, um, that this was an Islamic, um, what you could call, uh, dola in that context. And it was very unique how Abdul Hamid was doing that. Now, there was an attempt by Armenians to assassinate Abdul Hamid. And what happened, you see that carriage, um, there was a time where two Armenians, I think in the 1880s or 90s, I'm not sure that the date, they put um, a dynamite underneath his carriage. And Abdul Hamid was a sultan who by clockwork would, um, would do everything by the dot. But on this one occasion, he went to speak to the, um, the, the, the imam or the sheikh al-Islam, who was doing the, the, the Jummah khutbah at that time. And, and because he was five minutes late, the carriage was blown up and he survived. Uh, yeah, Hamza needs to go, his parents are calling me. Okay, mark his name in the register for Hamza. Okay. Hamza, you upset. You upset me, bro. And he's gone. Sure. We lost him. All right. So, um, one of the interesting things was, um, was Abdul Hamid's uh, then um, in a bit, in, unwillingness to um, uh, give up any of the domains in this sense. Because you say, here we have the Palestinian question. And it's true, it is true that Ab Abdul Hamid um, was unwilling to give up uh, goods um, to foreign powers or, or to, to Zionists and so forth. But it's also fair that Abdul Hamid was equal on this policy. He wasn't going to give up any land of the Ottoman domains to anybody in this sense. Okay, um, For him, this was all important. In the end, um, the, the rise of Prussia, as we said, which was Germany, was changing the dynamics in Europe um, in, in this context. Um, if we go to the next slide. Unfortunately, we can't do too much about Abdul Hamid, um, but um, the next one. Okay, so in 1908, we have a revolution. Abdul Hamid is in power for 33 years, but unfortunately for Abdul Hamid, 
um, there is an internal revolution that, that and these three men, so this is Talat Pasha on the left, Enver Pasha in the middle, and Jamal Pasha on the right, they have often been accused as being the three main men who were the leaders of the Young Tech Revolution, who sort of like subjugated Abdul Hamid. Um, so 1908, we have a revolution from the, uh, the Macedonian provinces of the Balkans, in particular, who move against Abdul Hamid because they want a constitutional movement, they want a constitutional government, they no longer want the autocratic government that Abdul Hamid has, um, and they put a lot of pressure on him, and he has to comply to the revolution in that sense. But this revolution is not anti-Islam in any shape or form, but it is very compromising for Abdul Hamid. In 1909, there's a counter-revolutionary event that, that, that counters the young Turks, it gets very messy, the military comes in and crushes the rebellion in 1909, and as a result, Abdul Hamid is removed from power. His brother Mehmed Rashad is put into power. Abdul Hamid is not killed, but he's sent to Salonika, which is today's Thessaloniki in Greece. And um, he is held under house arrest. And the young Turks are now by, um, they, they are like the shadows that are working uh, in the background um, in, op in the way that the Ottoman state is operated. And no, you know, Abdul Hamid is removed from power, and then in 1911, the Young Turks are in um, a host of compromising situations. The first one is 1908, which is um, the Bosnia is annexed by the Austrians, and also that Bulgaria um, makes a move for independence. So already the, the Young Turks are talking, moving from a back foot. By 1911, there's the um, Italian invasion of, of Libya, and the um, the uh, the young Turks then go to Libya to try to support the Libyans as a way of trying to stop the uh, the Italian encroachment. Um, Enver Pasha, Mustafa Kemal are two of the people that go to Libya, and they teach the Libyans guerrilla tactics as a way of trying to uh, resist the Italians. And no sooner had they done that, that um, the Balkan Wars had begun, and the Ottomans had to move their um, their focus to the Balkans. And now you have two Balkan wars in which the Ottomans are facing heavy losses and heavy defeats. And now we have a, a bit of a situation. Um, no sooner had the Ottomans come out of the, uh, the Balkan wars, um, it was the Ottomans were now wanting to hold an independent position. And they really did not want to get involved in, in, in any other war. But there was a situation which was that the, the contestation between the Russians and the Germans placed the Ottomans in a difficult situation. And um, the Ottomans would have preferred to be allies with the French and the British, but it was not tenable to do that. Obviously, the Russians were the enemy. And so the Ottomans, being closer to the Germans, um, made an alliance with the Germans. And they didn't expect, they expected the Germans to go to war with Russia. And if that would happen, then the Ottomans could have stayed out of World War One. But what the, the Germans did is they attacked the French as well. And by attacking the French, and the Russians, they caught the Ottomans off guard. Because by attacking the French, it allowed the British to get involved in World War I. And the Ottomans, by default, then had to um, get involved in the war on the side of the Germans. And this is where everyone gets, everything gets messy. And then slowly, slowly, step by step, um, you know, the Ottomans lose territories because they're, they're holding a defensive war. They're losing territories in the Arab provinces in particular to the British and the French. In India at a the time, there's a movement called the Khilafat Committee. This is really important for you guys to understand, for those who are raised and have parents in the Asia subcontinent. The Khilafat Committee, so this is uh, Maulana Kalam Azad, um, Ali Johar, um, and uh, the likes, they established a movement to support the Ottomans, um, to try to save the Ottomans from British encroachment. They were arrested and put in prison. The British had um, uh, said that they would not be sending in Muslim soldiers in particular to fight the Ottomans because they were concerned that these soldiers would defect and support the Ottomans. That did happen. We have a huge complexity of the type of Muslim soldiers that were fighting for the British, actually, because um, some of them would have been slaves. Some of them were Ahmadiyya Qadiani, um, and some of them um, may have decided to choose because they wanted to fight. We don't know. So the, the narrative is not clear in that sense what happened in terms of the number of Muslim soldiers who were fighting on the Ottoman front against the Ottoman from India. But nonetheless, um, the, the Hijaz is lost one by one. 
Makkah Medina is lost, Baghdad is lost, Al-Quds is lost, and the only thing that's left is parts of Anatolia, and the Balkans have lost too. The Ottomans have been totally compromised, and um, they were defeated. Um, well, the Ottomans are defeated because the Germans are defeated. And the defeat of the Germans um, means that the, the Ottomans are in a tight squeeze. The Ottomans were lucky that in 1918, we have the Bolshevik Revolution. The Russian Revolution happens in 1918, and that exposes the plan, which is called the Sykes and Pico Agreement. And it exposes basically that the British and the French had 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 made a plan to carve up the Arab world um, where they were going to uh, split the spoils of war amongst themselves. In doing that, it showed the treachery from the side of the British of the French, that they had, had always had ambitions from the Arab world. Um, and so the, uh, the Ottoman domains became very small. Within the Ottoman domains, you, know, you have two movements. You have a movement in Istanbul and you have a movement in Ankara. So you almost have like two governments. And there's a contestation between these two governments in terms of representing the needs of, of, of the Ottoman domains. Um, Mustafa Kemal was a representative of the Ankara government. And uh, Bahdeddin, who was the Sultan at the time, was a representative of the Istanbul government. And during the Treaty of Severus, um, they, had, um, they had signed terms. So the Ottomans had signed terms of capitulation, which was so extreme that um, the, the Turkey you see today was not part of, of, of today's Turkey. Um, it was a very small, um, so Istanbul was, was under occupation. They had parts of Anatolia, but, but um, places like Izmir and so forth would have been lost to the Greeks and things like that. So once um, the Greeks invaded uh, Turkey, the, the Ottoman soldiers decided to fight again because there was no way they were going to accept the Greeks taking territory from what they called Ottoman land. So this is called an internal struggle in which the Ottomans are fighting the Greeks to get them off their land um, to make sure that none of the, the, the lands of what you call today's Turkey, Anatolia, is lost in, in that sense. There's an internal struggle between the two governments in of themselves. And um, the Ankara government then signs what they call the Treaty of Lausanne, which is a far more favorable treaty of, of what we call today's Turkey. Right, and um, as a result of that, um, uh, what, what one of the things that the Ottomans did is they abolished the Sultanate in 1923, and then in 1924 they abolished the Caliphate. Okay, um, and after the abolishment of the Caliphate in 1924, the Turkish Republic decides to maintain an, an identity of secularism, in which um, symbols of religion and people of religion were heavily um, marginalized as a result of that. Um, this is the, the person in the middle is the Ottoman Khalifa. The woman on the left is his daughter. The man on the right is the Nizam of Hyderabad. And they got married. And the idea was is the Nizam of Hyderabad at the time was the richest man in the world. And so the uh, hope was that the richest man in the world would marry the, the daughter of the most symbolic Muslim in the world. And this would somehow um, revive the fortunes of the Ummah. And the Ummah would move to establish, a, 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 the, a, maintain the Ottoman Khilafah, but this was not possible without political power, clearly. Um, many of the, um, then the Turkish Republic went on a reform drive where it decided to, um, uh, to, um, to what you could say, any of the symbols of Islam or the ideas of Islam that they felt, they believed that Islam should no longer be part of the political structure and that Islam was holding the Turkish Republic back and that they should go in the direction of what the European and nation states had done. And so most of the institutions, if not all of the institutions in which the ulama belonged to, were deconstructed in some, some shape or form. The Nizami courts were closed, the Sharia courts were closed, the madrasas were closed, the Sufitekes were closed, the language from Ottoman Turkish to Latin script had been changed. Um, the um, ulama had to remove their hats, shave their beards, take off their robes, and many went into exile and others went into prison. Uh, and uh, basically, um, it was felt by the Turkish Republic at the time. I genuinely believe that they believed it, actually. I think they believed it, that, um, uh, you know, the Ottoman traditions, which was Islam, was holding them back, and that they need to go on this aggress uh, aggression. Of course, it's devastating for most Muslims. I think it was a mistake, no doubt. I'm going to think that. Um, I think that um, they should not have done that. 
um, but that's what they did, and this is where we would then see the emergence of the the, the uh, um, Turkish nation state, and uh, many of the ulama then went into exile um, into other parts of the Muslim world with Sheikh Mustafa Sabri Effendi going into exile into Egypt, uh, and Zahid al Qufri being another one of them. Um, yes, they even uh, turned the Hazan into Turkish. If you go on YouTube, you can hear the Hazan in Turkish if you want to hear it. Um, is, uh, have you have you heard it before? I think I showed it to them once, but if you want to play, we could. Uh, I, not really, because it's really um, scary and haunting for me. I don't enjoy it at all. But what's intriguing is that the Muslims would do the Azan in Turkish, and then they would come back in the mosque and do it again in Arabic. Um, but even they felt uncomfortable. They knew that they, they, they just something they couldn't swallow. And in 1950, when the, the Republican Party, when it became a two-party system, and there was an opportunity for another party to come into power, um, the um, Mendes's government was was put into power, and the Azan was turned back to Arabic. So you can see. Now, this final question is Asim squeezed in this very cheeky little slide near the end. Um, I actually found this image you found of, of Erdogan really interesting. Where did you find that? Um, you know, um, do I believe in the idea of a neo-Ottoman state? I don't. I can't see it, uh, personally speaking. Um, but what I will say is that. Um, um, I think for Muslims in particular, the imagination of the Ottoman past is important so that we can think of possible um, ways of learning from that past and fashion what we, we think is necessary for today. I think some of the ideas of uh, Ittihad al-Islam are necessary. I think those are really important ideals. I think um, the ideas of coexisting with non-Muslims is necessary. I think the idea of political authority needs to be thought about again in terms of how do Muslims see themselves in regards to that. Um, I don't know, I don't think that Turkey is doing that at this moment in time, although it's a slur that's used against them um, in, in many ways, um, as a way of, of trying to make it look like that the order the Turks are backwards or, the, or so forth. Um, so I don't see that, but it's used in, in political language, uh, the, the, this idea of a neo-Ottoman state. But what would that mean? Um, is, is the interesting question right now. There's a lot of good things that are happening in Turkey at the moment regarding Islam, but there's a lot of things of concern as well, you know? And I think this is the thing that we, we, we need to consider. Okay, Hassan Gruferos asked the question, nowadays do the Turkish people agree with Mustafa Kemal's abolishment of Ottoman Islam? It's a, um, to be honest with you, it's a, it depends who you ask. Um, there are some people in Turkey that are in agreement with this, they're happy with this, they're content with this. Um, they see themselves now 100 years on, this is part of their identity, they want to move on from this. Um, and they feel like today's reality is different from 100 years ago and that we should accept it. There are other Muslims who are not happy with that, clearly. We feel that um, that was a mistake, that should not have happened, and it should have been done differently. And they are a lot more critical. What we're seeing now more so though, is we're hearing more critical voices, which wasn't possible in the past, um, in that sense. So there are more critical voices of, of what had happened in, in that sense. Um, but just because those Muslims, I'll be honest with you, just because those Muslims are critical of that, doesn't necessarily mean that they, they want to do away the Turkish Republic and it should become something else. This is another interesting thing you learn when you're in this country, which is that the people still are quite loyal to the makeup and the, the nature of the country they live in. I mean, subhanAllah, I, I, I remember when I attended in Hassan Academy and you just the last 150 years is so complex and yeah. we've done no justice to it, especially the idea of the, the you know, the fake elections, yeah. the yeah. revolutions, counter-revolution. Yeah. 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 Totally. Like um, I said, I'm really sorry in terms of this last one, um, like I've had to force through so much information and you're right, I don't think I've done justice to it at all, which is... Um, I, I really do want to sincerely apologize for that. Um, I, you know, um, maybe I could have done it differently. Um, but what I will say is that maybe in another time um, we can do something where we can do the late period in, in more detail. Um, what we were trying to do, uh, I guess, and when, when Asim had asked me to, to teach you guys, um, is just to try to introduce this as much information as possible for you guys. And, and the, the idea was that I wanted to make this clear was that you have access to me. Uh, I don't want you to think you don't have access to me. So you have access to me whenever you want throughout your 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 lives in that sense. As long as I'm alive, 
So whether you choose to, to, to go to university and you want to continue studying Ottoman, you want to read about the Ottomans in terms of doing a, a, an undergrad or a master's or so forth, or you just want to read Ottoman history, you now have access to them. Knowledge takes time to learn, but the important thing is to have access to people who have access to that knowledge. And that's, this is what we were trying to do with these classes, which is to give you a visibility that uh, you have access to me whenever you want, and uh, you can ask me whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, and um, I will continuously be teaching you Ottoman studies in some shape or form. So this was the plan, okay? So I hope that's okay. Uh, um, I apologize. No, alhamdulillah. Just um, just to turn the recording off, um, I you know we just uh, we make du'a. Um, we thank you very much no worries, for no. for giving us your time. Uh, may Allah no, bless you immensely. Thank may you. Allah bless your family. May Allah Amen. bless the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a generality. Mm -hmm. uh, we pray that Allah Taala places immense blessings in your studies and in mm -hmm. your teaching and in your um, attainment of knowledge, and He makes it a means of us being. The coolness of the eyes of our master Sayyidina Muhammad mm -hmm. sallallahu alaihi wasallam, um, and yeah, just just thank you very much again. For no that. worries. You know, if I can say one thing, like um, look, uh, you know, when I was young growing up, I knew very little about Islam, and I have to say that I am so pleased when when I asked him sort of like uh, um, asked me to do this because if if I wish when I was your age that I just had access to to ilm in this way, you know. To have access to information, and you know, and uh, I'm really happy. And, and my interaction with you guys has been great. Even your criticisms of Liverpool, I can take that. <laughs> I don't mind it whatsoever. What I will say is, please, please, please continue learning. Stay, stay, stay out of trouble. Look after your parents. It's important that you look after your parents and your family. Remain connected as a community. Okay. Um, if you have the opportunity after this pandemic's over, ask your parents from time to time to to take you back to Muslim countries so you can learn something from going to those countries and learn as many languages as possible. Okay, so that you can, you know, it, this is the key. Alhamdulillah. On that note, Subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk.